topics. For this, as keynote speaker, Dr. Pramod K. Nair, sir, Department of English, University of Hyderabad, and resource person to the session one, Dr. K. S. Vaishali, madam, chairperson, Department of English, Bangalore University, Bangalore, another young resource person to session two, Dr. Payaz Ahmad H. Gilkal, PG Studies in English, Vijay Four. For this, we are glad on this occasion. Now it is time to welcome all the guests of honor and participants to this program and introduce our beloved principal, Dr. N. B. Ignar, sir, by our PG coordinator, Professor P. B. Badiger, sir. Good morning to you all. Uh, uh, webinar on the literary theories. At the outset, I extend a warm welcome to our beloved chairman, Dr. Virana Charantimat, for his guidance and his suggestion to organize this uh, great event. And secondly, I also extend a very cordial welcome to our Chairman College Governing Council, Sri Ashok Sajjan, for his encouragement to do all these academic activities. And thirdly, I welcome Dr. Pramod K. Naya, Professor of the Department of English, University of Hyderabad. On behalf of uh, this national uh, webinar on modern literary theories, I extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Pramod K. Naya to this uh, occasion. Welcome you, sir. And secondly, I also extend a cordial welcome to Dr. Kesh Vaisali, Chairperson, Department of English, Bangalore University, Bangalore, who is going to speak on the feminist theories. And uh, thirdly, I welcome Dr. Fayaz Ahmad Ilkal, Associate Professor in the Department of PG Studies in English, Rani Chandama University PG Center, Torvi Vijaypur, who is going to speak on Orientalism uh, at this you know, occasion. Finally, I welcome all the uh, participants who have uh, actively taken part in this uh, uh, webinar. So I welcome all of you, and it is my privilege to introduce a person who is very uh, uh, important for the organization of uh, uh, this webinar. That is none other than Dr. N.B. Ingna, who has put in 35 years of teaching experience in the sociology, and he is very much interested in the fields like study of social problems, community service, disaster management, and he has visited Sochi Island and participated as an Indian representative in simulation exercise on the earthquake uh, organized by the Philippines government and United Nations organization. He is the recipient and he has won a civil defense medal on the occasion of uh, uh, Republic uh, Organized Day 2019 for his meritorious service 
on this disastrous management and he is also the recipient of is the recipient of the uh, president and a visionary a man of ideas and during his tenure tremendously for the progress of uh, republic day 2019 the college and uh, just you know creating a very conducive and academic very dynamic and a visionary and during his tenure as a principal and for the progress of uh, and uh, just you know creating academic uh, atmosphere so lastly i will all the persons who are uh, very important from the point of view of organizing this national uh, webinar once again very cordial warm welcome to all those persons concerned taking part in this webinar uh thank you sir thank you very much now thank you sir now this is time to reserve to our beloved principal sir dr nb ingnar sir wish to the program by few words good morning all of you i am dr principal n b ingnor with the blessing of holiness param pujya biruru guru swami swami ji the founder of basveswara veera saiva vidyavardhaka sangha bagalkot in the year 1906 our basveswara veera saiva vidyavardhaka sangha is one of the pioneer and premier educational institution in northern region of karnataka the vasveshwara virasai vidyavardhaka sangha is doing aman service in the field of education present which has 157 institution from kg by the effort of present chairman our sangha dr virana charanti mat mla of bagalkot the goal of this sangha is to develop competent human resource and regenerate the traditional and cultural values of the land among the students our sri sr county arts commerce and science college mudor district bagalkot karnataka state india was established in the year 1982 to import higher education to students in this area i am extremely happy to share this on this occasion mudol is land of mahakavi kavi chakravarti ranna mudol is famous for mudol dogs at the national level and the dogs are used in indian army even mudol is also famous for sugarcane industries and cement industries mudol even halagli bedas of mudol talukas fought against the british in the first freedom struggle of india the college is affiliated to rani chennamma university belagavi and is listed under 2f and 12b ugc act 1956 the college offers four under graduation programs arts commerce science and bca and two pg programs ma english and mcom the college has excellent infrastructure with qualified and dedicated staff members our college girl student got 10th rank in arts two pg girl students second rank in the ma english to rani chennamma university belagavi and the nss unit is awarded as a best unit by rani chennamma university belagavi also college has credit of having 17 rani chennamma university blues and a girl student of our college represented rani chennamma university taekwondo team which won third rank prize in all india inter university competition now our department of english ug and pg under iqac organizes one day national level webinar on modern literary theories first i would like to congratulate to the department for this organizing task for this a keen as keynote speaker dr pramod k nayar department of english university of hyderabad as a 
resource person. Dr. K. S. Vaishali, Chairperson, Department of English, Bangalore University, Bangalore, on the topic feminist theories. Another young resource person, Dr. Fayaz Ahmed K. Yilkal, Department of PG Studies in English, Rani Chennamma University, PG, Swaravi Vijayapur, on the topic Orientalism. Keeping in mind modern literary theories. In the last two decades, in the realm literary and cultural studies in all parts of the world, critical theory theories has assumed considerable importance. Theory has grown into independent discipline. In recent times, knowledge of the critical theories is necessary to all the students. On the positive side, such knowledge can help as in many way to comprehend with the world better. And think more logically, the main objective of the webinar is to develop interest in uh, modern literary theories among the students in order to study of it. Now I am very happy to be part of this national webinar. Once again, I congratulate and wish to the organizing team, all the participants and to the webinars for its grand success. Thank you, thank you, one and all. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. As we know that one day national webinar on modern literary theories. As you know, in the last two decades, the realm of literary and cultural studies in all parts of the world, critical theory has assumed considerable importance. Theory has grown into an independent discipline. Literary theory is the body of ideas and methods we use in the practical reading of literature. Literary theory, sometimes designated critical theory, theory and new undergoing a transformation into cultural theory within the discipline of literary studies. Modern literary theory gradually emerges in Europe during the 19th century. In this observation, we try to make clear idea on the topic modern literary theories as per the need of the students who are, who are studying in their syllabus, like theories, Marxist theory, post-colonialism, structuralism, post-structuralism, modernism, post-modernism, intertextuality, psychoanalysis, orientalism, and others. In recent times, very necessary to each and everyone. On the positive side, such knowledge can help us in many ways to comprehend the world better and think more logically. The main objective of this theory to enable the students to understand the modern literary theories and develop in it. Uh, we are very happy to have you know this. Now it is time to go for keynote address. Dr. Dr. Pramod K. Nair, Department of English, University of Hyderabad. It's my pleasure to introduce Sir to you all. It's my honor, privilege, pleasure, and duty. English. Department of English, University of Hyderabad, India. He authored number of books on all the areas, the network of literature. His interests in cultural studies include superheroes, consumer culture, cool, post-humanism, 
a new media culture and his work have includes an introduction to culture studies in 2008 reading culture theory praxis politics 2006 virtual worlds culture and politics in okay wait i know i heard you and here this is on they can hear literary and cultural theory in the post colonial studies include english writing and colonizing aesthetics in 2008 post colonial literature and introduction 2008 the great uprising india 1857 which is written in 2007 the penguin 1857 reader 2007 his newest books include indian travel writing in the age of empire 2020 eco precarity extreme in contemporary culture 2017 human rights and literature it is written in 2016 besides numerous essays on cyber culture and more recently on human rights narratives biography autobiography studies images and text journal of post colonial writing celebrity studies and others now we are very happy to welcome on second to the this webinar and i request promoter to give keynote address yeah uh, pramod sir over to you sir hello hello sir please unmute yourself see for whatever reason if the resource person is unable to unmute himself or herself the admin has to do it by us i think there is a problem there you people will have to unmute him yes ma'am i have unmuted i think he is not able to hear
टेस्ट मॉडल है ना What is the problem, sir? Is not audible and even our voice is not heard to him. It seems. Oh, well, then it's a major problem. I don't know how you are going to solve that. Hello, shall we start a next session? Yeah, sure. But uh, but this is going to be a major technical problem. No, you still resolve that. No, ma'am. From our side, there is no problem. Ah. Sir is finding a difficult, uh, some difficulty. Oh, okay. His video is visible, but audio is ah. not audible at all. Madam, maybe, maybe has muted something there. Right? Yes, ma'am. And even if I want to unmute him, Madam, it is not visible. Yes. Somebody spoke to me in the middle. Madam. With your permission, yes. We go for our session, madam. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, Because, madam. Because I mean, I thought okay. let the inaugural program be over, but now that the program is over, still uh, the resource person is finding it difficult to log on. No, madam, there is no problem our side, madam. There is a technical problem. Please mm -hmm. cooperate mm -hmm. us. Okay, madam. Then we will go for madam. I cannot address my sir. Technical problem. All of us waiting for this. Yes, yes, surely. Okay, I can. Sir, am Please I audible? Please. Am I audible? Yes, madam. Yes. Yeah, because this is the. It is all present moment. And you are to have session one on the topic feminist literary, sorry, feminist theories by the resource person. 
ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಕೆ ಎಸ್ ವೈಶಾಲಿ ಮೇಡಮ್ ಚೇರ್ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಂಗ್ಲಿಷ್ ಬೆಂಗಳೂರ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಬೆಂಗಳೂರ್ ಫಾರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಐ ರಿಕ್ವೆಸ್ಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ವಿ ಐ ಮಡಿವಾಳರ್ ಸರ್ ಟು ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ಮೇಡಮ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಸ್ good morning everyone i feel happy to be part of this webinar and good morning everybody i feel happy to be part of this webinar and uh, i'm extremely happy to introduce the renowned scholar dr k s vaishali madam to this webinar uh, has has already you know about madam but it's my duty to introduce the great personality to this webinar uh, okay dr vaishali is a professor uh, and chief person of the department of post graduate and doctoral studies in english jnana bharati bangalore university bangalore bangalore karnataka in her 23 years of teaching career at bangalore university vaishali has taught several courses such as british literature indian literature in english translation contemporary literary theory gender studies translation studies cultural studies post colonial studies world literature in english etc she has played an important role in curricular development and syllabus design for undergraduate postgraduate and doctoral courses in english studies she has served as the chief editor of the english textbook committee for ba bsc and bcom courses of bangalore university and has brought out general english and ofnal english textbooks for ba and other courses of bangalore university she has successfully guided several students under the doctoral program in english studies still there is a lot to tell about madam swashali so is a bilingual writer in english and kannada and has also established her credentials as a literary translator her book titled prisoning rhythms a study of margaret atwood's poetry poetry explores in the feminist theoretical underpinnings in the 10 poetry collections of eminent canadian poet and a novelist margaret atwood vaishali's kannada translation padmaraga a feminist utopian novella by the bangladeshi feminist thinker rukaya takawa usain from the penguin english translation into kannada has been published by christ university kannada sangha Madam is also the author of Metamorphic Journeys Revisionist Myth Making in Contemporary Feminist Utopian Fiction Vaishali has also authored an erudite introduction to the context of writer Vaidehi's novella Vasudeva's Family published by Oxford University Press Madam has published several articles on feminist literary criticism and gender issues in various journals and books in Kannada and English Ima Vaishali's voluminous Kannada translation of Turkish novel laureate Oran Pamuk's political thriller Snow has been published by Srishti Publications recently and has won a critical acclaim in Kannada literary circles Madam has participated in numerous national and international conferences and seminars and presented papers on a wide range of issues in the area of English studies gender studies post colonial theory and literary translation she has also been a resource person at several seminars conferences and refresher courses and delivered keynote address and plenary 
talks at several national and international conferences. She has also participated in international conferences held in USA, UK, Thailand, etc. Vaishali has delivered lectures at the University of Stevens Point and Marshfield, Wisconsin, USA in 2009. She has also participated in the Millennium Canada Cultural Conference held in Manchester, UK and Austin, USA. Madam presented a paper at the International Conference on Asian Women Intellectuals held in the Royal Chololangkor University, Bangkok, Thailand in September 2013 and gave a Hindustani classical music vocal recital at the invitation of her Royal Highness Princess Mahachakri Sirindorn of Thailand in Bangkok. I feel happy to say this. Vaishal is a freelance music columnist and has contributed over 92 articles on Hindustani classical music to the newspaper, The Hindu. Madam is a performing Hindustani classical vocalist and has given numerous classical music recitals and lecture demonstrations in several cities in the country. country. For cultural organizations and universities in USA, Canada, UK, Singapore, and Thailand. Vaishali is the recipient of the Karnataka State Rajyotsava Award for 2011 in Hindustani classical music. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to introduce such a great personality to this webinar. Madam, please welcome again. I don't know what to say. Thank you very much. Please, madam, please. Over to you, madam. Namaskara. Um, thank you very much for that effusive introduction. Uh, I thought it would be a very abridged one, but you have introduced me elaborately. I'm deeply indebted to you for the affection that you have showered on me. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, I had to come into the second session. But uh, well, I'm commencing today's uh, webinar. Um, and uh, I will be speaking on feminist theories, but I thought uh, since I'm the first speaker, I'll fill you in a little bit on literary theories in general. Um, when reading literary theories as students and teachers, we have, uh, am I audible? Am I audible? Can you hear me clearly? Yes, madam, audible, madam. Ah, yes, okay, okay. So. Nothing will stop me from now onwards, uh, since I know I'm audible. Yes, coming back to my terrain, uh, literary theories, where I'm going to locate uh, the topic that I'm going to deal with today, uh, that is feminist theories. Um, a few general remarks about literary theories. Um, you know, so as students and teachers, uh, we know that reading literary theories um, would require a reorientation of sorts. It, it's going to be uh, a tremendously demolishing experience for all of us. You know about demolition, right? Why is it a demolishing experience? Because literary theories are so explosive in the sense they're going to explode and demolish many of the convictions that we have hitherto cherished as sacrosanct. A very sacred, uh, inviolable, and therefore cannot be relinquished easily. These are some of the assumptions and convictions that we have had about literature, about politics, about philosophy, about everyday relationships. And I would emphasize this point that reading literary theories is going to be a tremendously uh, uh, deconstructive kind of an exercise which is going to demolish and which is going to undo many of the things that you have held sacred to yourself. As I said, many of these sacrosanct notions that you think are inviolable or are um, cannot be, well, uh, desecration of it would amount to a kind of a blasphemy is what we would think. But literary theory easily banishes all these uh, so-called shibboleths. 
and uh, um, actually is dismissive of them as stereotypical assumptions that we have held about many things, um, various spheres of life, social life. Firstly, let's examine some of those assumptions. Um, uh, these are some of the ideas, recurrent ideas that pervade the domain of literary theory. Um, firstly, I would say most of the notions which we would actually regard or which we would usually regard as basic givens of our existence. What are some of the basic givens of our existence? Myself. Uh, this notion of my selfhood is very sacred and it is an absolute kind of an idea that we cherish or the notion of truth, truth versus falsehood or it could be even gender identity that I am a woman and somebody is a man. These ideas, even literature, uh, let's say uh, even our notion of what is good literature, what is great literature, what are some of the great canonical classics and what is, uh, let's say, populist literature, what could be pulp fiction, etc. These convictions that we have about uh, these institutions and uh, basically all these uh, um, ingredients that make up our existence are not as solid or as um, absolutist as we think, but they are all very fluid, unstable categories and they can be easily called into question. Okay, so literary theory contends that there are no fixed essences at all. Uh, if you and I are uh, holding God to certain things, certain phenomena are absolute truth. Uh, literary theory uh, posits a view that there are no absolutist categories at all. And so literary theories are very anti-essentialistic. And uh, if you have a unitary conception of gender, literary theory is deconstructing the phenomena of gender for you. Uh, just because the sexes are morphologically two, it doesn't mean the genders are also two. Okay, so this presupposes a very naive kind of a mimetic relationship between sex and gender. So literary theory is exploding that by saying gender or your notion of truth or even your notion of selfhood is socially constructed or culturally constructed. So there in the place of absolute categories, literary theoreticians come up with the notion of contingent categories. There are no fixed essences, but it's an anti-essentialistic kind of a free floating space where there are several signifiers and they keep changing, throwing up um, different challenges ahead of us. And uh, of course, there is uh, yet another. So what we think uh, of as politics is not just out there in legislature, in the executive, but uh, politics is something that pervades our relationships with everybody in the social uh, setup of a society. So politics is pervasive according to um, the literary theory. The very institution of literature itself, construction of a canon itself is a highly political activity according to literary theory or even your notion of history. What really goes into the annals of history and occupies the center stage in historical narratives is also a political act where uh, these political mechanisms, surveillance mechanisms regulate the uh, inclusion and also exclusion of certain subject positions and certain marginalized knowledges and, uh, and deliberately see to it that they do not occupy the center stage. Uh, do you understand? So your meanings are also sliding. And uh, we, you, you can see that uh, there are no stable meanings at all. They, they are unstable. And they also reject all these totalizing kind of uh, assumptions because they think all thinking is ultimately structured by prior ideological commitment. You can't uh, say, well, we, I come with an absolute kind of a neutral mind and I am totally unbi unbiased. Literary theoreticians do not accept these kinds of allegations, okay, these, these statements at all, because it needs to be read against the grain of what you are saying. So 
literary theoreticians are rejecting um, so-called passive reading positions and are enabling very active against the grain reading positions, oppositional reading practices, counter discursive practices of reading, where you go against the grain of the text. You also see the interpolative logic of the text. Uh, you see how these things actually and about language, we may think that language helps us to, um, you know, define reality. If the other way around, language is actually constructing reality for you. What you see reality is a reality effect that is actually mediated through language. So language is, um, is, is actually constitutive. It constitutes and structures everything that you know. Uh, so the entire world that you see around you is a textual construct that is actually engineered by language. So uh, this, so feminists also talk about the textual politics, how these textual practices of uh, dominant traditions of reading and writing construct different, entirely different subject positions for men and for women and uh, lead to the privileging of, uh, uh, you know, uh, male power and then sidelining female experiences. Uh, these are some of the recurrent ideas and I think this would be the frame of mind uh, against which you should be reading literary theory. Um, why did I take this much time to elaborate on some of these recurrent ideas is because these are probably the edifice or the bedrock upon which uh, feminist theories are also located. And uh, I guess you would all agree with me and it is... Um, indubitably so that uh, feminism is one of the uh, most exciting cognitive enterprises of our contemporary times. It's a, it's a major social movement and uh, also uh, intellectual revolution that was heralded by uh, feminist thought was tremendous and very lethal as well. Uh, why lethal? I will uh, just come to it because uh, if you see uh, feminist theories or say women's studies or less by gay studies or LGBT sensibilities, uh, what are called uh, queer studies, uh, Dalit studies, post-colonial studies, etc. Um, where do they come? Uh, if, we, if we look at um, uh, literary studies or, uh, you know, humanities and social sciences, uh, these have been uh, somewhere pejoratively designated as the new humanities. Uh, in fact, Foucault has a very interesting uh, appellation for them. And this uh, nomenclature, which I'm going to refer, to refer to during the course of my talk, um, uh, I will say subjugated knowledges. Um, so why are they subjugated knowledges? Because these knowledges, uh, so-called feminist studies, uh, or it could be post-colonialism, or uh, it could be queer studies, uh, these represent and they foreground certain exclusions and erasure and also elisions that have actually confirmed the privilege and authority of our dominant canonical knowledge systems. And uh, what have our dominant canonical knowledge systems done? They have ignored these disciplinary formations or have even sidelined them as minor subjugated knowledges, not really very adequate, may not be intellectually very sound. Uh, Deleuze and Gattari, two other French theoreticians, go on to call them minor languages, minor knowledges, which have been deterritorialized. Uh, what do you mean by deterritorialization? You do not have a ground to stand on. Uh, in, in fact, uh, why? Because again, there is a lot of sophistry here because if they come into their own, it will be a ground breaking kind of an explosion, which is why they've been deliberately sabotaged, marginalized and rendered ineffective and so on. So the politics of erasure is also something and the politics of exclusion is also something that needs to be examined very trenchantly according to Foucault, Deleuze, Qatari and other theoreticians. Okay, so these subjugated knowledges. So Foucault says uh, he presents this radical proposal of um, reclaiming all these so-called de-territorialized knowledges and re-territorialize them. 
that would herald in uh, uh, and usher in uh, uh, an explosive kind of an intellectual revolution which has happened because of the um, you know development of feminist cognition uh, today in our social space and uh, uh, okay so uh, we know that uh, it is not easy to reinstate the and and also to reiterate the marginalized positions in the face of the dominant positions can we do that because the uh, dominant majoritarian thought systems uh, can be so very bulldozing and they can easily trample upon uh, you know the body of discourses which are considered to be uh, subjugated knowledges so how do you do that Uh, you cannot actually possess a magic wand and say abra kadabra now i'm going to banish all the dominant uh, knowledge systems and uh, usher in the subjugated knowledge systems we cannot do that so well, how how do we go about doing it through processes of deconditioning and desensit and also sensitizing the uh, public uh, to the uh, violence that is actually perpetuated in the name of canonical authoritarian knowledge systems so they a uh, feminist uh, body of thought um, i i in fact deliberately titled it as feminist theories and uh, i'm also going to emphasize on the plural form of feminism it's not feminism as a monolithic singular category but mm -hmm. feminism according to me is a huge body of heterogeneous scholarship okay so it is uh, uh, there's a bewildering heterogeneity of feminist positions here so firstly mm -hmm. it shatters this notion mm -hmm. this is also deliberately very political sorry i'm getting disturbed there are other voices there can you mute them please this will interrupt my flow uh, i appeal to the admin to mute those voices yes can i proceed yes ma'am yes ma'am yes, ma ah, yeah yeah please mute those voices because that will yes, interrupt my flow yes, yes, so, yes, yeah can i resume can i resume please Yes, ma'am. You can start. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So I I was coming back to the 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 plurality of feminist thought and how it represents a very bewildering kind of a corpus of uh, heterogeneous positions. Okay, which also uh, actually uh, you know uh, show us um, how um, how. pluralistic and how resourceful and versatile feminist positions are uh, and feminism as a philosophical movement also besides being a, a social ideology or a political ideology so here i would like to stress on the plural form of feminism and it's deliberately political because it completely disrupts the notion of feminism as a singular category and uh, uh, you know all the dismissive kind of uh, you know associations that it would carry okay because uh, the notion of feminism as a singular category uh, tries to impose certain limits on feminism okay feminist positions okay and views it as a fixed kind of an entity in a single kind of a semantic space Uh, whereas it is not so at all and the plural form actually rewrites the category as something potentially transgressive and subversive okay so this is one of the victories of uh, you know feminist uh, movement uh, so feminism some multiple feminist theories are also multifarious and literary studies has been a very fruitful kind of a fertile space for feminist theory and literary text at once reflects and creates the world in which it is written and read and uh, therefore the uh, you know the 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 incursion also um, of feminist theory into feminist theories in plural into the literary space has helped us uh, examine the so called institution of literature and has also uh, uh, favored us with enormous kind of insights uh, which which i think is uh, very beneficial for all of us um, about uh, the certain assumptions that we have always held about the institution of literature 
namely that literature and literary writing is a very political act and uh, literary works are also political works in that sense uh, because they are politically constructed and therefore what we think what we hitherto thought as irreconcilable plural plura, you know polarities aesthetics on one hand politics on the other hand feminist theories demolish this they deconstruct this opposition between aesthetics and politics and show the hidden connections between the two okay so what is it that has uh, actually um, uh, what what agendas have been at work when we say that uh, mostly and preponderantly of course uh, works by male writers white middle class writers have found themselves in great profusion into the canon and uh, and also works by people of other races or even uh, racial minorities even sexuality minorities and women and uh, others have uh, and and also the colonized people have been deliberately kept away from the canon so what does this canonization indicate has it been political who says this is a great classic and who actually denigrates something as uh, not worthy enough to be included in the august uh, you know the 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 sanctified field of a canon well these considerations are extremely suspicious and thanks to the efforts of feminist theoreticians feminist historiographers and our subaltern theoretical collective that we see the the politics of these operations as very very insidious and uh, so uh, i'm i'm going on to say that this incendiary potential uh, of feminism to undo everything uh, probably and its ground breaking potential is tremendous which is why uh, i think this is a very important space for us to uh, actually cherish and uh, and try sadly well even uh, something as radical as uh, feminist positions and feminist cognition feminist pedagogical practices can be sabotaged and can be co-opted through many uh, surveillance mechanisms and also through many sophistical exercises of uh, of a very devious uh, uh, kind of uh, misogynistic um, character uh, i would just come to that Uh, what has happened to uh, let's say this um, uh, this radical uh, you know um, program of um, you know including and and also uh, this uh, this curricular kind of development exercises that we have taken uh, in a major way in many of our departments you know postgraduate and undergraduate departments of english literary studies well we have embraced gender studies but how does it exist Uh, well we cannot compartmentalize gender studies or feminist studies and go on to teach well british literature and uh, let's say i will teach uh, translation theory and i will also teach uh, post colonial studies and uh, you know and and a few other uh, uh, literatures you know commonwealth literatures like canadian literature or uh, australian literature or caribbean literature and then take up gender studies well this kind of an insularity and impalement of gender studies within a particular space in english departments has also would completely defeat the radical purpose of this discipline okay so i'm not proposing a very romantic ideology here but still the resistant potential the counter discursive potential of feminist enterprises and feminist theories cannot be ignored and it can only be ignored at our peril what has feminism not touched today please tell me it's uh, it, it's impact the, the impact of feminist uh, initiatives has been as uh, profound as uh, it has been extensive it has touched almost every sphere of our life take everyday uh, relationships in life or take discourses like colonialism or nationalism or take institutions of power like state the major educational institutions the transnational corporations and other disciplines like history uh, psychology or uh, biology the pure sciences and other social sciences and humanities you can see feminists have produced remarkably new insights into the very fabric of our social and cognitive lives and why is it because they have produced a revolution in the a domain of epistemology itself 
what i mean by epistemology here is the science of knowledge okay so again uh, i'm disturbed because there are uh, there are voices that i can hear so please mute those voices excuse me i can only hear those voices yes please ma'am you please mute those voices no <clears throat> yes ma'am yes ma'am see everything <clears throat> should be silent because it's an online platform yes right let me come back to where i was um, yes i was talking about epistemology uh, the kind of uh, radicalization of our uh, world views that has happened because of feminism okay so firstly in the realm of epistemology itself so when we come to uh, the territory of education or the domain of education higher education of course epistemology and education are interlinked because epistemology is all about knowledge and education uh, aims at imparting knowledge and dissemination of knowledge and uh, knowledge systems and so on but uh, it goes to the uh, you know to the great uh, uh, credit of feminist theoreticians who have sensitized us to the epistemological narcissism of many of our knowledge systems what do you mean by epistemological narcissism uh, because many of these canonical or so called dominant knowledge systems have constructed them is in a very authoritarian fashion as the self and the women and the subjugated minorities the racial minorities the the subalterns the colonized etc as the other um, as the other whom who cannot actually represent themselves and therefore those who are in power those who are actually at the helm of authority need to represent the interests of those who do not have the power and who do not actually occupy dominant positions of power okay so this has been a view point which has actually been completely uh, called into question by feminist practices and uh, so this is how the epistemological narcissism uh, is exposed and uh, it is called into question and the violence and the tyranny that is practiced on the basis of epistemological uh, superiority is uh, being pointed out in a very trenchant fashion by feminist theoreticians so feminist theoreticians are sensitizing you to the epistemic violence that there is in the um, so called canonical knowledge systems uh, i just gave you the example of uh, the literary canon itself the canon was considered to be a you know that is why where the where did the word canon come from it came from it has a very biblical kind of an aura to it isn't it so uh, almost violating the canon would mean uh, it's a sacrilegious activity it's almost like a uh, an anti um, you know a, a blasphemous kind of an activity so this kind it was filled with so much dread okay so who actually created so much of dread uh, you can see that this is actually nothing but politics of another vicious kind so you see uh, these kinds of against the grain reading practices have been validated only because of marginalized positions like feminist theories okay so which are uh, multiple and which are also extremely interdisciplinary they have also completely overthrown and shattered our conception of disciplines as watertight compartments uh, you see gender pervades everything i mean i think your your most rudimentary identity in a human society would be your gendered identity okay so the victory of feminist theories has been to actually to point out and emphasize gender as a point of crisis in the literary and cultural political social and cultural space of the nation state 
uh, gender was neither to an invisible component of course it was always there it is all pervading but it was deliberately kind of kept out of the way but uh, thanks to feminist theories they reinstate gender and bring it to the center stage okay so now it gender uh, fe feminist theoreticians have always and uh, feminist studies has always emphasized that gender has to be a very important analytical category gender cannot be an additive but gender has to be a transformative epistemic activity because when you bring in gender as an I, 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 as an ingredient into everything that you read uh, definitely it throws up very interesting and newer inflections of meaning um, so you see today how uh, uh, there are multifarious kind of portmanteau words that have associated themselves with gender gender bending gender blending gender fluidity or um, you know gender gender discriminatory practices gender bias we'll we'll come to some of these and examine them uh, what what does it show that it has thrown up newer inflections of meaning and gender is a very polyvalent kind of a word okay so uh, uh well i'll just come back to some of the theoretical trajectories of uh, feminist positions uh, we are all aware of the first uh, wave feminist and second wave feminist and third wave feminist movements so i will see that fem uh, i will just uh, share these observations with you um the first remark that i made was um, about feminism was that feminism was a is a major uh, why was is still is is a major social movement with a tremendous transformative potential okay and has produced remarkable insights into the very fabric of our society okay so how did it happen because these were um, you know um, uh, anglo american pan european kind of women's movements that took place in different parts of 20th century okay so we we look at the first wave feminism itself uh, it situated itself on the edifice of uh, gender equality okay so they well uh, these were all liberal uh, uh, feminist you points okay so we see uh, although here again uh, just to make uh, a small uh, kind of um, you know um, um, just digression uh, the word feminism or the appellation feminism may be new but uh, feminist thought has existed down the centuries as uh, far back as uh, uh, you know uh, the work the phenomenal work of mary wollstonecraft a vindication of the rights of women okay so you see there wollstonecraft was making an eloquent plea okay for uh, the right to female education okay so in victorian england okay so you see but well she didn't call herself a feminist okay so the appellation may be is of recent origin of recent provenance but the thought that it embodies has existed uh, right from the time of uh, you know uh, elizabethan era okay so if you take uh, the work of amelia lanya who who tries to uh, bring in a feminist perspective and ask certain very strident uh, feminist questions about uh, you know about about eve's rights uh, you know as adam's wife and uh, so on salve the rex juderum which was her monumental epic poem that she wrote as far back as in the 16th century uh, so you see feminist thought uh has um, has always actually been there it has been deliberately cast into oblivion and we we come back i, I was coming back uh, to the 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 kind of bickerings and the canonical wars that have been fought and uh, so and the stakes have been very high which is why uh, many of these so called mind subjugated knowledges contend that they have been deliberately suppressed from articulating themselves okay so uh, so they are anti essentialistic and they are also anti foundationalist in their spirit because they are rocking the foundations of all these major disciplines okay so while coming back to the first wave uh, feminist movement 
um, as I was saying, the, the, the first wave feminist movement, of course, was not really an earth shaking kind of a movement in the sense it, it actually expressed its faith in, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in the nation state. And it said, well, a liberal nation state would extend uh, many privileges to its citizens. And it was clamoring for active citizenship for women, okay, for suffrage rights for women, literacy rights for women, and also rights to employment. And uh, as long as these conditions were met, uh, they said, well, gender parity uh, as a dream could be met, uh, could, could be actualized. Okay, so these were the principal demands of first wave feminists. But then later on, from first wave feminism, when we see the cognitive shifts and the paradigm shift in second wave feminism, you see that it was a, a phenomenal kind of a rumbling uh, kind of a, a revolutionary potential that the second wave feminist movement had. What was the slogan of the second wave feminist movement? Uh, the personal is the political. And there are certain remarkable feminist writers um, who are part of this second wave feminist, uh, uh, you know, uh, movement and cognition uh, about whom I need to speak briefly and then come to the French feminists and then link it up with post-colonial feminism and then end my talk. Do I have time for all that? Um, hello? Yes. So I'll continue since I don't get any feedback. Uh, okay, so, uh, uh, well, uh, coming back to second wave feminism. Okay, well, uh, uh, second wave feminism was theoretically even more formidable. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was rather bewilderingly intellectually insurrectionary movement. Okay, so it, uh, it, it really percolated uh, deeper into this fabric of society and also our psyches. Okay, by then you must remember there, there was a phenomenal kind of an excitement in uh, the domain of humanities and social sciences because of psychoanalysis. Okay, we discovered that we, what we consider uh, to be the unitary idea of selfhood itself was fallacious and fictionalized kind of a construct because what we really believed as the self did not really exist. What we considered to be the self was actually a multi-layered self. It was not even unitary. The self composed of the ego and the superego, as Sigmund Freud uh, pointed out. And then also the psychosexual stages of development. Uh, feminist theory and there was Marx who talked about production and uh, you know also the exploitation of the proletariat okay so the Marxist and psychoanalytical insights and uh, and also the evolutionary theory of Darwin and the existentialists had all actually uh, ignited this spark within the uh, domain of second wave feminism uh, you see uh, the, the pioneering work of Simone de Beauvoir who was an existential feminist herself, The Second Sex, which was published in 1949 and almost immediately, I think, translated into English by H.M. Parsley. It was, uh, it was brought out in France as Le Deuxième Sex. Okay, so where uh, Simone de Beauvoir contended that uh, one actually becomes a woman and one is not really a woman to begin with. Okay, so this was uh, gender was actually a cultural construction. So uh, feminist theoreticians, it, it captured the imagination of the second wave feminists that many of them went on to explore these ideologies of immanence and transcendence, which were given out by Simone de Beauvoir in, in many ingenious combinations and permutations. Uh, I will come to one of the earliest liberal feminists, namely Betty Friedan. Uh, you see all these... Uh, uh, feminist uh, activists, okay, so activism is a very part of the impact feminist theory itself, um, you know, uh, 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 abolishes and rejects this dichotomy between activism and theory. It bridges the activist and academic divides because feminist theory is majorly anchored in the lives and experiences of women. And it also banishes and it dis is very dismissive of another fallacy, namely, uh, which has has its roots in empiricism or, or in an empirical idea that namely that women can be feminists and only women can be feminists. First thing that you need to reject uh, totally is this uh, uh, so-called, uh, uh, you know, myth that, uh, you know, uh, this mimetic relationship between women and feminism needs to be reinforced 
been established. Not at all. Uh, I think many of the crusaders uh, for feminist rights have been men. And particularly in the Indian subcontinent, as you see in the colonial India, you see the, the pioneers in the realm of uh, uh, throwing open uh, literary opportunities for women, for, for lobbyists for female literacy, female empowerment, widow remarriage, and abolition of child marriage, etc., were men. Okay, so you see, uh, feminism itself believes, feminisms and feminist theoreticians believe that as a cognitive kind of a practice, uh, of even as a pedagogic kind of a practice or as an ontology, it's equally accessible to men and women. Okay, so it is not barred, uh, you know, in the sense, well, there could be androcentric realities, which can also be deconstructed by men. Okay, so feminism becomes a very important theoretical position that would aid you in a deconstructive analysis, even in a post-structuralist analysis. So you see the major uh, tools that feminists have used in their uh, revisionist rereadings of the canon, in also in politicizing the hitherto so-called uh, uh, yeah, political things have they have made use of Derrida, they have made use of uh, Foucault by showing you the hidden connections between, uh, you know, between power and uh, knowledge and how those in power actually try to usurp knowledge and then uh, fashion it around themselves and also create this illusion that knowledge only emanates from those power centers. Okay, so these connections have been made very clear by feminists thanks to the insights of Michel Foucault, Derrida, and others. So you see, these are all interlinked. So you can't say I will study feminist theory separately, post-structuralism separately, and then, um, you know, a deconstruction uh, separately. They cannot be viewed as watertight compartments at all because insights from uh, post-structuralism and deconstruction have percolated in a big way into the feminist arena. Okay, coming back to the second wave uh, feminists, uh, see, most of these feminists derive their inspiration from Marxist civil liberties movements in America and in Britain, but they were also quickly disillusioned because they don't, they did see sexism in uh, those belts, uh, you know, of, um, you know, civil libertarians or uh, others who demanded uh, equal rights, etc. So they, they found that uh, women constituted the ghetto. That's what prompted them actually to discover sororities of their own. Yeah, you hear of, um, you know, consciousness raising and, uh, and such exercises that were undertaken to mobilize the spirit and the morale of women, to boost the morale of the women activists in the movement. Okay, so Betty Friden is located around this continuum in 1963, she writes an explosive book called The Feminine Mystique, where she's talking about the, um, the, the existential angst of a middle class, even white middle class, um, you know, homemaker in United States of America, who is immured or probably entrapped in the private sphere and her utter helplessness when it comes to accessing power centers in the public sphere. Okay, so it talked about economic self-reliance. It also talked about the right to self-determination for women. And closely following upon that was another explosive book by Kate Millett called Sexual Politics, okay, which also um, talked about um, a very disturbing, which, which brought out a very disturbing hypothesis. It said that um, the, the ideology of um, sex, the, the, the sexuality that as you and I know, um, has a very political side to it. And uh, a politics is not something to be located only in the domain of legislature, but there are power structured relationships even in the intimate arena of sexuality. Okay, so sex, uh, so, so she says sexuality is something that is culturally and socially constructed with political consequences and politically constructed with social consequences. And she said there is a, this uh, sex class system as another uh, radical feminist called Shulamit Firestone in her monumental work Dialectic of Sex pointed out is a, a deliberate kind of a uh, colonization of women okay by male power these institutions of male power so your ideas of 
um, well, so they said they examined the role of uh, gender, you know, in the patriarchal system. And they also saw to it that major institutions, why it was a patriarchal system, because these were all institutions which championed male power and privileged men and stood for male supremacy. So they said that uh, it was so pervasive, it was so ubiquitous that it was difficult to pinpoint where exactly the patriarchy functioned. But it became a kind of a catch-all enemy which sabotaged many other positions and rendered them irrelevant, rendered them voiceless or powerless. Okay, so there was uh, uh, Kate Millett who was talking about the ideological indoctrination of women, okay, and, uh, and the subordination of women within the sex class system. So this sexual politics was an ideology which prevailed and which also saw to it that patriarchy reigned, uh, patriarchy flourished unchallenged. Okay, so one of the major linchpins of male power in patriarchy was this sexual politics or ideology of sexual politics. So she said, well, literature as an institution actually functions with the same protocols and with the same value system that the larger society actually professes. Okay, so literary conventions actually are literary practices encode social conventions and they are ideologically complicit. So in her revisionist rereadings of uh, misrepresentations of women, okay, so in, in literatures, okay, so um, um, Kate Millett uh, heavily criticized many of the male writers like Norman Mailer, D.H. Lawrence, etc. And uh, it was also, in fact, the note was, uh, the dissident note was also ably struck by Simone de Beauvoir when uh, she discussed the phallic criticism in D.H. Lawrence. Okay, so, uh, so she said there was nothing but epistemological narcissism. You try and uh, you practice this kind of a sexist literary criticism. And um, also um, there was Mary Elman who writes a very interesting book called uh, um, The Thinking About Women, where she uh, expatiates upon a very interesting phenomenon that we see in the domain of literary criticism called thought by sexual analogy. What do you mean by thought by sexual analogy? Um, she, in fact, she is referring to uh, some of the major thinkers like Bruno Bettelheim and others. Uh, just to uh, give you a sample and the the, I, the sarcastic and the sardonic uh, flavor of Mary Elman, who comes up with a very witty castigation of this thought by sexual analogy, which uh, which was practiced unapologetically in literary critical circles. She says the same fixed mode of thought runs uninterruptedly beneath the seeming expansion of the modern intellectual opinions. What is it? Uh, for example, she gives you an illustration. She says, when Bruno Bettelheim characterizes the male mind as expansive and exploratory and the female mind as interiorizing, uh, any fool can guess he is only envisaging to put it brutally, I'm not, uh, it's not my words. These are uh, Mary Elman's words. She says, the literary critic is only envisaging the mental copulation, if not physical sexual intercourse. Uh, he says, what does it mean uh, to designate women as interiorizing and men as exploratory and expansive? Uh, he says, aren't you bringing these very obvious kind of uh, sexualizing uh, literary discourse itself? Okay, so the, the literary act of creation itself, so to say that, uh, uh, so there has been this kind of a fallacy that any work of art, any work of literature that is produced by a woman itself is treated as a woman. Okay, so you must remember uh, uh, the times when the Bronte sisters um, actually came into visibility. Uh, in fact, uh, they were uh, so apprehensive about declaring their female identity in public that they all pseudonymously published their novels as Cura Bell, Acton Bell and Ellis Bell. And uh, the moment they come to know the identity of these authors, that they are not Cura Bell, Ellis Bell and Acton Bell, they're not three gentlemen, but they happen to be three Victorian women, all hell broke loose in Victorian England. Okay, so they were chastised in, uh, you know, in, in, in various ways. So you can see what kind of phallic criticism is 
practiced. Okay, so feminists actually accuse uh, the, the the entire establishment of literary criticism as perpetuating certain phallocentric practices. Okay, so they are so solipsistic that they that they refuse to contend with the other. The other is always the ignoble other, and therefore the unknown other, and can be just banished into nothingness. Okay, so this is something that was pointed out in a very sardonic fashion by the second wave feminists. Or take up uh, German Greer, whose books, uh, you know, sold millions of copies. The the radical, very disturbing title called the Female Eunuch. Okay, where Greer calls a woman in the patriarchal society, okay, who is violently repressed by these uh, sexist norms or heterosexist norms, is not really a woman because she has never been able to actualize her potential as a woman. She exists as a eunuch, according to German Greer. So she says, "I call her the female eunuch." Okay, so uh, these were some of the pivotal classics of the second wave feminist movement. So starting with, uh, you know, uh, Kate Millett's radical conviction of this entrenched ideology of sexual politics, which pervaded all patriarchal societies, uh, the slogan came uh, into vogue in second wave feminism, namely, "Personal is the political." Okay, so you see here, um, well. Um, and these were what are called emancipatory feminists okay so they were paving the way for uh, you know women's emancipation well feminism uh, the feminist theories and feminist positions and feminism as a philosophical practice moved further away uh, 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 progressed a little further from so called uh, uh, what are called emancipatory aims into um, into a disturbing realm of anti essentialism okay so you have uh, from from there you take on um, you know the the impetus will probably shift to the anti essentialistic deconstructive feminist that you see in the french feminist uh, uh, you know uh, universe um, take uh, helen ciso or lucy rigari or uh, um, even julia kristeva well even these people uh, they, they are actually here um, it was contended that anglo american uh, movement feminist movement is is more um, pragmatist and activist in its orientation and french feminism is more philosophical in its orientation uh, to some extent it's true but to some extent you can challenge that also because there are traces of great essentialism there also when helen ciso talks about le critique femina the female language when she says uh, it seems to sound a bit essentialistic well so what were fem french feminists saying they were also looking at the uh, the role of gender in language and writing how how languages and writing practices actually constructed and coded gender okay so that you get entrapped within those codings so it was very important for people like helen ciso to change this language okay to transform this language so that the language comes closer to the female body and it can also uh, actually uh, come up with a very radical kind of reconception of what it is to be a female subject or subjectivity itself and then um, julia kristeva talked about going back to the pre edipal okay so the pre edipal semiotic kora she says and lucy erigeri talked about a diffuse kind of a female language which would be as diffuse as female sexuality okay so these um, of course post lacanian uh, psychoanalytic feminists were also actually revolutionizing the domain of um, female subjectivity and then from there you see uh, this same uh, so called picco foucauldian paradigms motivated uh, anti essentialistic deconstructivist uh, thinkers like uh, judith butler uh, judith butler's probably postulation of gender identity or her uh, deconstructivist kind of an operation on uh, uh, the entity of gender perhaps is the most radical of all 
uh, where uh, Judith Butler goes on to say this mimetic kind of a presupposition that attachment and association that we bring between gender and sex itself has absolutely no logical basis. If sexes are morphologically two, and we say gender is a social construction or a cultural construction, why is it that we need to think of gender as again, uh, you know, uh, uh, as two entities? It need not be because what we consider to be masculine or feminine gender ideas are equally accessible to men and women, but it is patriarchy which actually uh, impels the feminine and ascribes the female gender to the feminine gender to the female and masculine gender to the to the male. For for Judith Butler, gender is nothing but performativity. It's a performance. All of us are actually remember uh, when Shakespeare said that the world is a stage and we are all men and women are actors. When she goes on to say a little more, uh, probably what our Vachana uh, Kara said, Nadive Suliva Atma Gandu Allah Hennu Allah. Mole mudi bandare hennem maru, gandam, gadda mise bandare gandem baru. Uh, see how they've exploded this myth. That's a very uh, phenomenal kind of a deconstructivist insight, according to me, uh, which I think the 12th century Vachnakaras and Vachnakartis have accessed. Uh, so Judith Butler is more or less, uh, I'm not oversimplifying uh, Judith Butler, but the cognition behind it, uh, the, you know, the cognitive insight behind it, probably your vachanas help you understand it. Uh, so uh, there is Butler saying that gender is at best a myth. It's a regulatory fiction. Why regulatory? It doesn't mean that because gender is a free floating kind of an artifice, one day I'll be a woman, next day I'll be a man. No, no, no. Because there are reinforcing mechanisms within the social fabric, which will punish you for any so-called, uh, uh, you know, effeminacy. Okay, so what, what is the biggest kind of, uh, you know, humiliation that could be heaped upon a man that uh, he is too woman-like, lady-like, or feminine, a sissy, or a feminist. Okay, so you see there are these... Um, brutal mechanisms that will proscribe you from the male community itself if you're not much of a man. So called this uh, emphasis on masculinity, aggressive or let's say hyper masculinity. And then also this um, so called angel of the house, the ideal uh, uh, feminine virtues that a woman is supposed to profess. Okay, so these are regulated, these are violently policed within any patriarchal society. Okay, so gender is at best of and, and at worst it can only be a myth and it is a fiction all right but then you are supposed to take on this identity and you're rigorously policed okay so uh, so judith butler in gender trouble completely problematized the notion of gender itself okay and rendered it anti-essentialistic where do you now you see the, the feminist fictional output that came up there was a tremendous upsurge in feminist fictional output also during this time in the 1990s and 1980s so imaginatively explored many of the convictions of these radical feminist theoreticians that were articulated in the feminist theoretical arena you see they are all played out as tropes as uh, metonymies and metaphors in the fictional canvas that women have created one biggest victory of uh, the feminist movement was the uh, the efflorescence of the the exuberant uh, output of feminist science fiction okay science fiction provided an idyllic realm for the feminist to banish the constraints of realism okay realism and also patriarchy and boldly reimagine uh, the 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 sex role stereotyping of our contemporary societies it's a, it's kind of initiated a very interesting tension between what is possible and what could be possible and and what actually exists and how it can also be changed how it can be viewed differently okay feminist utopias and feminist utopias uh, dystopias have brought in this kind of uh, um, you know have incorporated these and have been very sensitive to the uh, amazing cognitive paradigm shifts that we see in the second wave feminist movements uh, look at um, uh, handmade tale of uh, uh, you know uh, 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 margaret atwood for example or look at uh, you know a classic utopian story like uh, Sultana's Dream by uh, Rukaya Shekhawat Hussain, uh, written as early as in 1905, uh, for example. In fact, this was published even be 
before the upsurge of the feminist movement in the west this ambitious story where uh, you know the protagonist of the story a parda clad woman enters an imaginary land of um, you know an imaginary elfian land where she sees uh, only women in the public sphere and there are no men at all the public sphere of this uh, country uh, of this city state is actually characterized by a concept conspicuous absence of men uh, and she wonders where the men are and uh, and her lady friend who has actually escorted her to this land tells her sultana our men are all in mardana they are busy looking after the babies they are busy cooking they are good at embroidery they don't come out out into the society it's the women who actually uh, run all the administrative machinery of the city state okay so where she was making a, a, a sardonic kind of a very hard hitting commentary what does it mean exclusion of women from the public sphere is as ridiculous as uh, entrapment of men in the mardana and how did she achieve it through this beautiful technique called defamiliarization okay which even our romantic poets like wordsworth and coleridge use and also yet another technique called the willing suspension of disbelief okay so you know this cannot be true but you just participate in the happenings of that world okay so uh, well and uh, feminist uh, feminist utopianists have also constructed imaginary worlds where they have actually uh, questioned and called into question the notion of gender itself they have uh, they have seen they have created uh, characters uh, men with secondary uh, you know with female secondary sex characteristics and they have also dreamt of parthenogenetic uh, Uh, you know societies where reproduction itself is not the realm of a woman okay so um, you see there are other kind of scientific revolutions that have taken place and uh, you know these um, radical uh, utopian texts like march piercy's woman on the edge of time okay so where uh, you, you see these kinds of utopian societies what do they do they they also introduce uh, very dissident voices of androgyny neither man nor woman but an intermediate sex and these kinds of tropes actually um were very interestingly presented in the fictional canvas of feminist science fiction which which also made us debate about the uh, the crippling conventions of our contemporary social realities and question perhaps should we move away from it okay and uh, there is handmade tale which is a dystopia which is located in a futuristic america where america has become a patriarchate and uh, which is a very chilling voice of warning and what is the biggest tragedy and the biggest danger there at the heart of that biblical patriarchate the gilead it is environmental collapse okay so there are uh, the environmental apocalypse is hinted so very chillingly which is why they are into you know uh, production of organic vegetables and becoming an organic society and then also the the the, the population human population is almost becoming extinct uh, so the, the why am i mentioning hollywood you know uh, handmade tale is because of our current uh, covid pandemic situation see to what extent human greed or so called patriarchal uh, tyranny and misogyny can drive the society into a state of environmental you know calypso and complete environmental denigration these voices of eco feminism which have actually linked the denigration of women and uh, also the devaluation of women with also irreverence towards the environment and callous neglect of the environment and have brought them together i think are very very cautious um you know and salutary uh, fictional worlds which actually warn us of the impending disasters that may overtake us if we go ahead in our strident um, you know masculinist authoritarian fashions well uh, well now again uh, it's not so hunky dory again in this world of feminism we cannot say that uh, just as how feminism banished these credos of universalism from the western canon and said what is being actually brandished as universalist as objectivist uh, you know as objective as the universalist kind of a premise is always a racist sexist androcentric kind of a premise beyond uh, you know so called universalism there could be the ugly realities of imperialism colonization and so on uh, when it comes to the territory uh, the feminist territory itself there is 
a lot of cacophony and it's an interesting one as that okay so they say that feminist scholarship the so called anglo american french feminist scholarship okay does not really ring true when it comes to the asian and the third world women okay so you see that there is a kind of an epistemological narcissism with the western feminists accuse the canonical knowledge or knowledge of is being practiced towards third world women okay so these are also the accusations that are heard at the western feminist academia that there is um, that the muted figure of the subaltern is that of the gendered subaltern and the gendered subaltern stands there voiceless whereas her voice is being hijacked by uh, the so called western feminists okay so this this was another interesting kind of a viewpoint and a rejoinder that was ushered in by uh, you know the post colonial uh, feminist voice Uh, which said that uh, well sorority cannot be actually um, uh, cannot be a highly individuated model of female emancipation which means emancipation of the western white middle class woman to the annihilation of the so called gendered subaltern just as it happens in the text of jane eyre which gayatri sivak uh, discusses in a very poignant fashion in three uh, in in the in three women's text and the critic of imperialism uh, when she talks about and makes a dig at this um, so called salvation of jane eyre at the expense of a poor bartha mason why because bartha mason is not uh, uh, not a completely woman she is half creolized and she is a foreigner and therefore she can afford to die but a jane eyre can get emancipated so feminism must stand ultimately for the emancipation of all women women of color women uh, you know women who are also from uh, you know disadvantaged backgrounds uh, you know women of various uh, you know caste class and also uh, you know uh, and other community positions and at the same time the so called privileged women from the western world is feminism it does not uh, actually promise uh you know the 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 ideology of emancipation for all women okay if there are problems there then that cannot be called a feminist position but that would only be that would only be branded as some kind of female self aggrandizement uh, so there is a world of a difference between uh, feminist rhetoric and female or a rhetoric that smacks of female self aggrandizement uh, these are certain caveats that need to be kept in mind so i would say feminist theoreticians are myth decipherers and revisionists who are also uh, uh, disenchanting i mean you know who through these processes of desensitization and also deconstruction um, make us see the politics of Um, literature and literary acts and and decode these hidden connections between aesthetics and uh, politics maybe i can take on your questions or uh, uh, if if i have time i can continue and... sir okay and can i stop here no madam continue madam yeah. as you wish yeah no no i just don't have much to say but a few things on after this so this is and when it comes to the relevance of uh, you know these initiatives uh, well as as i told you um, now uh, i just wanted to talk about a few other instances of eco feminist uh, uh, you know sensibility which uh, i think uh, is a very salutary kind of a warning for people of our times especially now who are now grappling and are in the throes of covid pandemic and are clueless uh, you know uh, about salvation about how to actually find a remedy for this solution so it's it's important when i come back to the uh, you know the interface of feminism with ideologies like post colonialism um, i just want to raise a few more issues here and stop here and uh, one was the 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 progressive uh, the the very uh, incisive kind of an unhappy collage you know um, uh, what do you what can i say collision between feminist and anti colonial sentiments okay so 
here edward said also in uh, in his book somebody is going to talk about uh, yeah fayaz is going to talk about orientalism but i'll bring in culture and imperialism of edward said here in culture and imperialism of edward said edward said talks about the post colonial nation state and uh, he also says um the post colonial nation states uh, would do better if they actually um, learn from their mistakes and what what is that from their uh, so called uh, male supremacist kind of vantage points if they were to come down and then they, they, they were to actually include everybody uh, the include the so called uh, uh, you know disadvantaged people also into the fold uh, then perhaps it augurs uh, you know a better uh, future for um, you know the post colonial societies in in other words he's talking about the um, uh, the the, uh, the the sexist or male solipsism of Uh, anti-colonial strands in post-colonial societies. We'll have to examine the nationalist movement itself. So when you see um, the nationalist movement, when you examine the provenance of the nationalist movement in the colonial India, when uh, they were uh, when they were going to embark on a series of agitation for uh, winning freedom, political freedom for India, what was the rhetoric of the nationalist? The the nationalist completely sidelined the woman. one's question um, you see when uh, pandita ramabai or even rukma bai and others rukma bai is a victim of child marriage and she um, uh, she educates herself she becomes one of the first women doctors she goes to britain and comes back and her husband she was married off unfortunately at the age of 8 and then uh, later uh, when rukma bai comes back from england Uh, her so called putative husband who was married at the age of when when rukma bai was 8 years old uh, with whom she has never lived actually goes to the court uh, filing for restitution of conjugal rights and rukma bai writes an open letter to queen victoria uh, saying well uh, you are our queen and therefore i appeal before you uh, this Uh, this marriage as a ceremony uh, was actually performed when i was not even aware what actually marriage meant and so what rights does he have to press restitution of conjugal rights kind of a suit against me okay so and at that point of time the nationalists like tilak and ranade and others um, vigorously uh, actually uh, criticized rukma bai and uh, also uh, issue a clarion call to the entire community to withdraw their support to rukma bai okay so you see this was one major bone of contention between the 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 the, the feminists or the so called women's liberationists and then the nationalists okay so why were to why were they two divergent paths so uh, here is where i think we need to also learn from the third world african intelligentsia when gugi says um, you know no decolonization is not possible without women's liberation so feminism must remain very crucial to any project of decolonization there can't be any you know uh, oppositions there and so i think uh, for us the best example would be gandhi ji when he endorses androgyny when he rejects hyper masculinized kind of rhetoric of nationalism and when he embraces the female virtue and espouses androgyny and non violence okay so uh, and and that's why G- uh, gandhi said um, he wrote about the god's eunuch and he said i'm a eunuch before god and he said i would like to embrace that position okay so this was a very um, uh, a, a very characteristic very strategic kind of a dissenting angio- androgyny which was espoused uh, in a uh, contradiction to a very militant kind of masculinity that was endorsed by the hitherto nationalists in the in the previous era and uh, i would like to stop here and so the the potential of feminist theories as i told you uh, is tremendous and we can explore it uh, when uh, if there are questions or if there is some kind of a debate on those thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and thank you thank you madam thank you very much 
thank you madam thank you very much for your well informative session now we have a question by yeah. dr pooja madam ट So this yeah, is your question. Uh, I no think, issues. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So that you will be free, ma'am, after this. Session. Right. Right. Yes, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. One question: That can we say that feminist thought was widespread in India long before in the West? If so. Are there any theories to substantiate this aspect? Oh my God! I think this was the point I kept on making. Can I making. repeat, madam? Yeah. Yes. No. 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 I understood it. Well, uh, which was why I I laboured upon this point again yes. and again throughout my discourse. The appellation called feminism. ये नाम करना ही दिया ला, स्त्रीवादान ती दिया ला, that may be of recent origin, but what is actually embodied in feminist thought has been voiced since time immemorial, probably since the evolution of mankind itself. So you go back to this um, very interesting uh, collection of women's writings edited by Suzy Tharu and Lalita. Okay, women's writing in India, volume one and two, brought out by Oxford. Uh, Uh, university press what is the earliest uh, you know example of women's writing that is discussed by suzy tharu and lalita in the anthology teri gatha by the buddhist nuns the bikunis of 6th century bc so uh, and and what kind of strident uh, uh, you know questions about female subjectivity and women's rights and women's emancipation and women's aspirations do these bikunis put forth they are not living in our post modern uh, contemporary 21st century mind you they belong to the bc before christ era uh, but you see the the feminist convictions that resonate so powerfully in the in the poems and in the songs of these buddhist nuns and dating back to 7th century or 6th century bc uh, so you cannot have a better example than that Okay. What, or what about Sanchi Honnama, for example, who writes, uh, who says, "Pendu penden deke bilu galay varu kannu kanna da gavi laru." So, what do you call uh, Sanchi Honnama, a 12th century Akkamaha Devi, or even a Mira Bai, the Mahanubhava Sreeth of our bygone era? So, I would say they were all feminists in their own right, but it's not fair for me to appropriate this name and this label. Uh, you see this kind of a label came about and this kind of a christening ceremony happened only in our times to say that's why i'm saying feminism as a philosophical practice as a cognitive enterprise okay and the thoughts that it embodies is not new it's part of the human rights movement i would say i think one of these uh, prose essays of shashi desh pande best illustrates this um, i wish i have a recourse to that i would like to read it out if you can give me just a little time when she says um, when i say i am a feminist says uh, shashi desh pande i would say that i am a feminist because uh, she says i i feel men Uh, just a moment today when i call myself a feminist i believe that female of the species has the same right to be born to survive to fulfill herself and shape her life according to needs and potential within her as the ma male of the species has women are neither inferior nor subordinate human beings are uh, but women are only one half of the human race and women must not be straight jacketed into performing certain roles that may actually thwart them of their potential motherhood does not bar other things for women when i say it is a bonus it is an exclusive privilege that women have which of the non feminists would like to deny these 
So this is a very, very moving kind of a plea uh, when she says, which is why I'm unhesitantly a feminist. And that's why I don't see this kind of, I don't understand this kind of ambivalence about or this pussyfooting around this appellation called feminism. So if you believe that women constitute one half of the human race and therefore are entitled to the same rights and privileges that men have, and women have certain other additional duties, uh, which no, anti-feminist would object to that. Okay, so see, look at uh, feminism in a, in a broadened kind of a perspective. Thank you. Yes, is that all? <coughs> Are there any more questions? Um, yeah, you're not very clear. I'm Can you're not audible. The of feminism in the you're not audible. Now, you're not audible. Okay, one second. No, madam? Yeah. Am I audible, madam? Yes, yes. Okay. Can you yes. explain the element of elements of feminism in the Malayalam novel, Chemin? No, we will not take up specific uh, things like that. As I said, this is obviously uh, discernible. Uh, you know, so, uh, uh, well, you firstly need to uh, you know, come out of this frame, say feminism in something, women in something, women in that work or women in that work, in this work. Okay, so that again is, uh, I think, a very, uh, very wrong way of actually approaching the feminist cognitive enterprise itself. Okay, so you're robbing this, um, you know, gender studies of all its very turbulent political radical content by actually rendering it completely bloodless. So it cannot be feminism in one particular work. Feminism has to be a worldview against which you view all knowledge systems, is what I would say. Okay, so that should help you overcome the blind spots in many of our dominant reading and writing practices. That's the way you need to actually look at feminism as a pedagogic practice or as a tool or as a subversive kind of a, a theoretical, um, you know, armament that you possess in order to reorient yourself and unlearn and situate yourself in some of the unfamiliar territories which you have not visualized. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. Thank you, ma'am. And it's not actually that was not my question, madam. Question by participant. <laughs> okay. And now session two. <clears throat> with your permission, madam. I will move to the session two okay, on the topic Orientalism by, by young researchers. Dr. Paya, now I request Professor I. S. Krishnan sir. So welcome and introduce me Dr. Fayyaz to all of us. Good afternoon to all of you. Good afternoon to all of you. Firstly, firstly I'd like to welcome Dr. Fayyaz Professor and a local department of studies and research in English, Ramachandra University, PG Center for We, on uh, 8th August 2015 to till date. So, sir did the MA in the year 2003 from Karnataka University, Darwar. He was awarded PhD in the year 2011 from Karnataka University, Darwar. <coughs> He has qualified select and he is working as a research guide. He has seven years of teaching experience as an assistant professor and research supervisor. Sir has delivered talks as a keynote speaker, plenary session and shared sessions 
at uh, national and international conferences he is a member of a sports committee rcu he is a center vijaypur he is working as a coordinator uh, for minority center rcu peace center vijaypur he is a member of board of uh, examination belagavi board of examination member akmadevi women's university vijaypur so board of studies member gulbarga university kalburgi member of english study circle south africa sir is a member of iscs indian society for commonwealth studies he has published 21 research papers at national and international conferences and published one book entitled family life and society in a select place of author miller so thank you for giving me this wonderful opportunity thank you one and all sir yes please sir yes please what do you what do you now i am audible yeah fine yes, sir. yeah good afternoon everybody uh, principal sir dr n b ingna sir and then iqac coordinator dr a u rathod and then pg studies in english coordinator professor p b badiye sir and then professor pramod naya sir professor vaishali ma'am my friend mahaling jogi and then my colleagues and participants and management faculty members so it gives me immense pleasure to be a part of this grand uh, uh lecture uh, uh, one day online webinar uh initially when i was approached by my friend mahaling jogi he had asked me to uh, take up any topic which is been uh, uh, prescribed for ug students of our university so when the madam had agreed upon uh, feminist theories so i thought that i will pick up this text called orientalism written by edward said i have prepared one ppt to put forth my ideas and then this is how edward said looks like so the objective of this uh, presentation will be to explore the idea of the orient in edward said's orientalism text specifically to this text the question which i will be addressing in this presentation of mine is what is orientalism who are orientals and where is the orient to begin with i would like to tell you that this text orientalism uh, is an a foundational text for post colonial studies and initially edward said in his argument he gives us a three types of definitions to for this orientalism so in his introduction he says Uh, that it takes initiative by describing orient in order to expose the vital common western misconception about the east so he uh, very vehemently attacks that it is the western misconception about the east and this text in this text he tries to uh, deconstruct all those misconceptions that the westerns have about the east and even the term called the orient is not an uh, Uh, eastern one by in fact it is an western invention which is an western construction of the term called orient he says that this misconception dwells in the western mind in such a way as if it were irrelevant that the orient itself was actually sociologically affected so as if it has been orient have been invaded and it has had an influence on their culture on their political and on on, on their geopolitical uh, geopolitical affairs but in, instead it is the either way and then he says and he uses this phrase called the other to describe the western fascination with the orient as one can only find an idea of them just through a contrast with an other and there has been always a binary opposite and that is on this context that he uses this term called the other and this is a fitting comparison to say 
Sayed's topic, considering the emphasis he puts on the Orient's special place in the Western experience. So it is not about the Orient, but it is Western's very much uh, fascination towards Orient that has influenced their construction about Orient and Orientalism and about the Orient. Said so suggests that the Orient does not mean the same to American as it does to the European countries. So here he, he says that it is it has lots of influence on uh, European continent because they're adjacent to, uh, uh, to uh, Orient or to that country. And it is... Uh, uh, the way it appeals to Americans, it is very much different to the way it appeals to the West. And then uh, this makes an historical sense as well. And he continues to say that Orientalism in terms of academic interpretation, he refers to it to the field of work of anyone who teaches, writes about or researches the Orient. The definition is generally too distinct as compared to the introductory designation. So Orient, the term Orient or Orientalism has so many uh, approaches, but here he is approaching this uh, term called Orient from an academic perspective, especially for those who are involved into teaching Orientalism or who are writing about Orientalism or who are doing their research into this Orient or Orientalism. So this definition is generally too distinct as compared to the introductory designation. And again, he has two more definitions to say about what is an Orient. Although it incorporates the multiple discourses of knowledge, it fails to distinguish the Orient as existing comparatively instead of just being the subject of examination. So he says that it is not a term just to be uh, just as a subject of examination, but it is much more compared to that. And then the, in the second definition, what he says, uh, he, he, he tries to draw attention to this distinction and clarifies Orientalism very much clearly. And he also uh, clears uh, the misconception of the West and even the entire globe that Orient, the term Orientalism or the Orient is not limited to only the Middle East, but it is about the entire East. It may be the Middle East, it may be India, including Russia as well. And the third definition, what he proposes, he proposes the third definition, wherein he says that <clears throat> he, he analyzes substantially more applicable in the historical context. And then Orientalism as the corporate institution for dealing with the Orient as the Western authority has done. So he takes a Foucault and he professes, and initially he expresses that he has been motivated by the notion of discourse as propagated by Foucault. And his Foucault in his theory, he has come to bear on this discussion are his ideas of the critical relationship under which the ontology of subject and object come to be known. Just a minute, the annotations are uh, irritating. I'll disable. Yeah. So according to Foucault, the problem is not isolating any empirical conditions that may bring out this subjectivity, but to determine what the subject is and to what conditions it is, it is a subject. So said, uh, said's application for this, he refines his third definition well and provides a strong platform for the rest of his argument. The Orient has for much of history been the active object to the European missionary and scientist positions. He further lists, he lists his findings about the recent history of the Orient. There are lots of chat, chat going on, which has been uh, yeah. So say suggests that the balance of power from Franco-British involvement to a largely American involvement has not had so great an effect Orientalism as would be expected. This is because the Orient is not nearly as sterile as effective Western domination would bring about. It is thriving entity just 
like those cultures that have power over it. Additionally, his observations make a sense in the scope of colonialism since certain sections of the Orient have been excluded from the whole at certain times, the Middle East or India. In his qualifications for interpreting Orientalism, said in, Said includes several points of interest and clarifications. He agrees with Disraeli in saying that the East is more than just an idea with no corresponding reality. In fact, this is concurrent with the fact that many Western scholars have decided their entire lives to studying the Orient. And secondly, he also says and reinforces that it is irresponsible to discount the control that the West exercised over these societies and it have been uh, exercising it. The study of Orientalism could not exist had the East not been the victim of Western power and domination. Sayed differentiates between the types of society and how cultural influence is derived. He cites Antonio Gramsci, who has coined the term called hegemony, as distinguishing between civil and political society and the different configurations and responsibilities therein. So according to Gramsci, a political society is one in which the citizen is directly dominated and imposed on by the state who creates and maintains the social institutions. Civil society, however, is made up of citizens voluntarily affiliating themselves with certain social responsibilities. Only under this type of society does the derivation of cultural enterprise initiate itself. So Gramsci's main argument as that is of any form of society that is not totalitarian, certain types of culture will thrive. So it is this societal happening that he calls hegemony, which Syed explains is the phenomenon that necessitates interest in cultural otherness such as Orientalism. So after listening to these three aspects of his contemporary reality, Sayed discusses and attempts to address these uh, three realities that would bring the puzzle of Orientalism closer to a solution. So these three aspects are the foundation of the entire argument. And this Orientalism is a text which runs through almost 400 pages, but I just uh, try to highlight some of the important aspects of this text in hardly 20 or 25 slides of mine. And then he also, uh, he goes on to differentiate between pure and political knowledge. He mentions the difficulty of dis distrusting political knowledge in the realm of a subject that is so interconnected with the politics and internal international awareness and which cannot be separated at all. And it has an implication on our day-to-day -day living as well. And then it seems to come through in the writing that said, Sayed is finding it hard to address a problem that is so deeply involved in imperialism, yet not trustworthy of political knowledge. So this sharp paradox problematizes his attempt to understand Orientalism in its historical situation. So the second step is the proposition of his methodological devices, which are in answer to uh, the evident absence of the problematic in his study. So he says he uses these devices to examine the authority that is dis descriptive of the Western's relationship with the Orient. The first device is strategic location. So in this strategic location, what he says, he describes an author's position in his study with regard to the Orient. So every person here who writes about the Orient must associate themselves with either the Orient or the West. Otherwise, he has no uh, business to deal with. Uh, this is what is his first uh, contention about when he speaks about the strategic location. Therefore, adding certain connotations and themes to their interpretations. And so it is the prerequisite either you, you should be from Orient or from the East in or West in order to discuss or to have some kind of an authority over this subject. <clears throat> and then strategic formation here, the second device here which he speaks about is incorporates the study of the Orient and the way in which different intellectuals stand 
points gain acceptance and credibility and again thanks to imperialism what he say what he has to say about this and then just as everyone must be either associated with west or east anyone who considers they orient in their thoughts must create a basis for the for whether argument or position they assume so whatever argument or position they assume the intellectual basis of the position is composed to of referential knowledge that relates to other works and at the end of this section he reminds the reader that information is popularly disseminated by a culture it is only a representation of truth not reality itself uh, so when it when it comes about representation of uh, truth and not reality itself uh, i would like to draw your attention towards rudyard kipling's poem the white man's burden and wherein the image itself uh, gives an idea as to how the west have been uh, tried to thrust uh, their uh, ideology and their uh, all the institutions and all those things into on our east and that is why he says that it is uh, not uh reality but it is the representation of truth wherein uh, <clears throat> and he uses this clarification to elucidate the use of language as being culturally not universally expressive and the final reality that must be addressed to bring a greater understanding of orientalism is what sayed calls the personal dimension so this is the third dimension which he speaks about and he quotes gramsci again here and uh, he quotes that the starting point of critical elaboration is the consciousness of what one really is and knowing thyself this quote applies directly to the subject matter at hand and also to sayed's analysis of it and he also mentions his upbringing uh, the pertinence of which relates back to the uh, aforementioned methodological devices considering his particular background and previous knowledge of those who are involved in the orient some elements of his personal reflection on orientalism are the long history of prejudice against people of arab and islamic descent the struggle between the arabs and the israelis and its effects on american population the one sidedness of this struggle and has to be mainly with the largely liberal american identification with zionism and the reinforcement of the stereotypes of the orient in the electric and popular media Sayed delves further into the reasoning behind the futility of a positive view of Arab life in the West. His remaining comments include that his experience as a person of Arab descent are what motivated him to write about Orientalism in the first place. For someone who is so directly and negatively affected by Western perceptions of the Arab. world and the orient altogether his analysis is fairly objective and sophisticated view of orientalism so perhaps it is because of his experience maybe with uh, lifelong stereotypes and the apparent dichotomy of western and the eastern approaches to the subject and everyone have their own perspectives and their own bone of contention about it and then his final comment is somewhat of uh, of a plea to the reader in the hopes uh, that if a greater understanding of the topic is derived from the reading then an urban learning of the process of cultural domination can conceivably begin so that is a process of learn unlearn and relearn so throughout uh, sayed is attempting to lay out the foundations of how the concept of orientalism is understood through a historical analysis of britain's relationship and experience of colonial rule over egypt and also he reviews who is called oriental and how we begin to label others uh, say he reviews how knowledge and power creates the ability of one group to obtain authority over another group and there's a stripping the autonomy away from the other and this is another way of stamping upon your authority on the other so moreover uh, sayed continues by noting that this dominance allows <clears throat> for the group with power and knowledge to accept the superiority as the norm
and it takes for granted their position of authority. For example, the West will uh, take their position of dominance and al analyze all beliefs and views uh, and which differ from their own as abnormal. As Western notions become more powerful, we automatically begin assuming positions, qualities towards the dominating group and negative qualities uh, towards the weaker group. Thus, attributes, behaviors, and cultural norms are compared to the Western norm. And this is then allowed all Western thought to be rational and normal and all others thought patterns to be irrational and strange. And Sayed uses his first chapter to describe how the concept of Western domina dominance over the East uh, or the Orient created an ideological framework which looks at the East as a least superior than West. This is what uh, Sayed describes as Orientalism. And it is always the other, uh, uh, the, the Orient and the Occident, the weak and the powerful and the white and the black and the civilized and the barbaric uh, and then uh, the rational and then the exotic. And it is based upon all these things which is going on building uh, the idea about the Orient and the construction of uh, Orientalism. <clears throat> And then Sayed outlines his argument with several limitations as he states that it fails to include Russian Orientalism and explicitly excludes German Orientalism, which he suggests had clean pasts and could be promising future studies. And it is again a very, uh, uh, that is why maybe America is not included into post-colonial studies or uh, no one has yet taken up America as an Oriental uh, way of approach. And Sayed also suggests that not all academic discourse in the West had to be orientalist in its intent, but much of it, he also suggests, uh, that all cultures have a view of other cultures that may be exotic and harmless to some extent. But it is not this view that he argues against. And when this view is taken by a military and economical dominant culture against another, it can lead to a disastrous results and which we have been seeing the post Gulf, uh, Gulf War also. And then uh, Said starts by analyzing public speeches and even before Gulf War also, uh, World War One, World War Two have also been uh, best example for all these disastrous results. Uh, please don't chat while I'm presenting my paper because uh, it diverts my attention. And then Sayed starts by analyzing public speeches and writings of two British imperialists of the early 20th century about the Egypt, making uh, an emphasis on how the stress that since the British imperial authorities know better their country, they have a natural right to rule it. So <clears throat> British knowledge of Egypt is uh, Egypt for Balfour and the burdens of now knowledge may such make such questions as inferiority and superiority seem petty ones. So Balfour, no way denies British superiority on the Egyptian inferiority. Egyptian here is Orient or uh, the East as well. Uh, Egypt has been taken up as an... Uh, uh, I please request all the participants not to chat on the chat box because always it pops out on my screen. which will impact the flow of the lecture as well. Hope and how hope you understand. So therefore now uh, Norway denies British superiority and Egyptian inferiority. He takes them for granted as he describes the consequences of knowledge. During his involvement in imperial affairs, Belfour saw a monarch who is in 1876 had been declared Empress of India. He had been especially well placed in the position of uncommon influence to follow the Afghan and Zulu wars. The British occupation of Egypt in 1882, the death of General Gordon in the Sudan, the Russo-Japanese war and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and the two great uh, themes dominate his remarks here uh, in what will follow is knowledge and power. And as Balfour justifies the necessity for British occupation of Egypt, supremacy in his mind is associated 
with our knowledge of Egypt and not principally with military or economic power. That has to be very, very clear. And then the knowledge to Belfort means rising above immediacy, immediacy beyond self and foreign and distant. The object of such knowledge inherently vulnerable to scrutiny. This object is fact which it develops, changes, or otherwise transforms itself into the way the civilizations uh, frequently do. Nevertheless, uh, is fundamentally, even ontologically, it is stable. And Balfour is of the view that it is a good thing uh, for these great nations, and he admires their greatness, that this absolute government should be exercised by them. So he thinks that it is a good thing, and experience shows that they have got under it for better government than that in the whole history of the world they ever had before and which not only is a benefit to them but it undoubtedly a benefit to the whole to the civilized west so balfour states we are egypt not merely for the sake of the egyptians though we are these for their sake we are there also for the sake of europe at large And then free native institutions, the absence of foreign occupations, self-sustaining nation sovereignty are the demands rejected by Coma, who asserted that the real, he is one more critic, uh, <clears throat> who says that the real future of Egypt lies not in the direction of a narrow nationalism, but which will only embrace native Egyptians, but rather in that of an enlarged cosmopolitanism. So Arabs, are shown to be devoid of energy and initiative, intrigue, cunning, and unkindness to animals. That is what I said about being barbaric. And Orientals are uh, invertebrate liars. They are lethargic and suspicious, and in everything oppose the clarity, directness, and the nobility of the Anglo-Saxon race. So Balfour and Comer, both the critics, they have used many terms to explain the relation between the Orientals and the Orient. So the Oriental is irrational, deep, uh, depraved, childlike different, declaring the European is rational, virtuous, mature, and direct. So in Cromer's and Balfour's language, the Oriental is depiction as something one judges, uh, as in court of law, something one studies depicts as a discipline, as in a school or prison, and something one illustrates as in a zoological manual. So from Orient to Oriental. So Orient is a construction of the West, and the Orientals are the people belonging uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the East. So in short, Orientalism is a set of constraints. And limitations of thought that is simply as a positive doctrine. There are lots of chats happen, uh, going on. Please abstain from doing this. So I request all the participants, please cooperate. Don't all the time it me. pops out on my screen, that's why. Uh, the, the flow of the lecture will get curtailed. Uh, I get distracted. Hmm? Okay. <clears throat> So Orientalism is a set of constraints upon and limitations of thought that is simply uh, as a positive doctrine. If the essence of Orientalism is the ineradicable distinction between the Western superiority and the Oriental inferiority, then we must be prepared to note how in its development and subsequent history, Orientalism deepened and even hardened the distinction. So Oriental, uh, Orientalists ideas took a number of forms during the 19th and 20th centuries. So as in Europe, there was a vast literature about the Orient inherited from the European past. So Orientalism can also express the strength of the West and the Orient's weaknesses as seen by West. So such strength and such weakness are intrinsic 
to orientalism because they are the view that divides the world into two so now one more critic kissinger in not value free and he used the words as a prophetic accuracy internal uh, <clears throat> empirical reality and order throughout his description and they characterize either attractive familiar desirable virtues or menacing peculiar disorderly defects so for the traditional or orientalists as kissinger conceive of the difference between the cultures first as creating a battlefront that separates them and then the second is about the inviting the west the west to control uh, the east or the other and another critic like uh, uh, glidden he states that it is notable fact that while the arab value system demands absolute solidarity within the group it at the same time encourages among its members as a kind of rivalry that is destructive of that very solid very solidarity so the purpose of this learned this quisition is merely to show how on the western and oriental scale of values as they relate to position of the elements is quite different so the argument was that there are westerners and there are orientals so the former dominate the latter must be dominated which usually means having their land occupied so their internal affairs rigidly controlled their blood and treasure put at the disposal of one or other western power so political domination had to be justified therefore in the course of the 19th century a bunch of theories turn up with persisted into uh, which persisted into the 20th century and which constructed the colonial subject as an inferior to europeans in logic in culture in moral etc 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 and many resources were invented in this vision of oriental people as it is justified and legitimized domination so the orient was viewed as if framed by classroom the criminal code the prison the illustrated manual so the reason why it is been dominant has emerged uh, since the time between britain and france two of the colonial powers have been colliding uh, in order to uh, gain uh, control over the globe uh, so in a way they have cooperated to secure cultural domination over these uh, lands so thanks to both britain and france uh, for having uh, thrust upon uh, this uh, uh, this ideology of a superior and inferior the east and the west so in a sense of orientalism was a library or archive of information commonly and in some of its aspects unanimously held so the crux of it is that the west has created a dichotomy between the reality of the east and the romantic notion of the orient so the middle east and asia are viewed with prejudice and racism so they are backward and they are unaware of their own history and culture so to fill this void the west has created a culture history and future and promise uh, promise a better future for them and on this framework rests not only the study of the orient but also the political imperialism of europe in the east so with this information about orientalism i conclude my speech thank you hello sir hello hello yeah okay sir okay thank you sir thank you very much for your know well informative session thank you very much sir for your well informative session and uh, we hope that you know uh, promos are unable to connect to this you know webinar please i would like to ask all of all of you sorry for that 
and actually you know we are going to that we're unable to connect to the sir please uh, please forgive us and with you know permission of you all of you and we will go for that you know vote of thanks yes we haven't any questions in chat box with your permission would like to move to the and vote of thanks by our you know professor thank you much yes sir chairman sri ashok sajjan sir uh, resource persons ladies and gentlemen uh, i feel privileged to say vote of thanks on behalf of our college to thank our chairman of bv sangha dr virandan charanti bhat sir uh, for his consistent support to conduct such webinars similarly i have to thank and our honorary secretary mahesh athni sir for his support and uh, now to our college committee chairman sri ashok sajjan sir uh, for his consistent support to us to re uh, to reach such achievements i would also like to thank our beloved principal for his guidance in conducting such use, useful webinars i am also thank, thankful uh, to our co coordinator professor p p patigar sir for his encouragement in the same way i would like to express my thanks to professor jogi professor madwar sir professor hiramat sir and others for their hard work to get success in this webinar i am also thankful to professor kulkarni sir prof professor reshmi sir for their technical su support i am also indebted to all the contributions once again i think i thank everyone who helped helped us in this task ask thank you one and all thank you very much